Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chakshurum Militam Yena Tasme Si Gurave Namaha Asanulam Bato Bhujo Kanaka Badhatu Sankitanai Kapitaro Kamalaya Takshu Vishwambaro Dvijabaro Yugadharma Palo Bande Jagat Priyakaro Karuna Bhutaro Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai, Sisi Krishna Arjun ki jai, Chile Si Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada ki jai, Bhakti Rakshak Sita Dev Goswami Maharaj ki jai, O Pramanandi. Tonight we're reading from 17th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. 17th chapter deals with the visions of faith. Previous chapter Krishna described the divine and the demonic, and the emphasis in that chapter was on Shastra. Krishna determined for Arjuna, that basically those who adhere to scripture, they are of a divine nature, and those who oppose it are of an ungodly nature. So in this chapter, Arjuna poses a good question. Arjuna Bhatra, ye shastra vidhim utsritsya yajante shadayan vita, tesham nishta tuka krishna sattvam aho rajastama. He asks, ye shastra vidhim utsritsya, these are the same words that concluded the previous chapter. Krishna says, Yashastri Vidamutsticha Vartate Kamakarata Nasa Siddhamabhapnoti Nasukam Naparam Gatim. Who doesn't follow the Shastra doesn't get happiness, no perfection, and doesn't attain the ultimate goal of life. So Arjuna asks, Yeshastri Vidimutsticha about those who reject the Shastra. But he is not asking about those who entirely reject the Shastra, because he's asking about faith. He says, what about those people, yajante shodayan vitaha? They worship with faith, but they neglect the Shastra. The previous class, they don't worship with faith, and they reject the Shastra. They are ungodly. And then, in that previous chapter, there are the godly who embrace the Shastra and worship. So he's asking about kind of an in-between class of people. And it's a fairly common group. They worship. They're not opposed to the scripture, but they don't really know its conclusions. Out of laziness, they don't take the time to deliberate on the import of the Shastra. But by tradition, by what's passed down over generations from the forefathers, they have a certain god and worship, and those gods are in the scriptures somewhere. But how they fit into the whole pantheon of Hindu gods, what's their place, they're not aware of this. Quite a few people fall into this category, and Arjun wonders, what's their position? Is their faith of the nature of Sattva, Rajas, or Thomas? These three, the three gunas, they were described in the 14th chapter in some detail. That chapter was dedicated to them. And so many things were classified according to them, and they will be further in this chapter as well. This is the inquiry that begins this chapter about faith. And Krishna answers, prefacing his question, he says, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Trividha Bhavati Shraddha Dehinam Sa Sobhavaja Satviki Rajasi Chaiva Tamasi Cheti Tamsrinu. Hear from me about Trividha Bhavati Shraddha Three kinds of faith, Dehinam Sa Sobhavaja, that is, of the embodied Embodied souls have three kinds of faith, and that faith is born of their materially acquired nature, svabhavaja. means from their previous karma, they were born of a particular svabhav nature, and accordingly, they have faith. It is either sattvic, rajasic, or tamasic. Text 3, Krishna says, Sattvanu rupa sarvasya shadha bhavati bharata. Shraddha mayo yam purusho yo yach shraddha sa eva sa. One's faith corresponds with one's mind, O descendant of Parat. A person is made of his faith. One is whatever his faith is. So faith is a very substantial and tangible reality. We hear about it sometimes as if it's something that's not tangible at all. Sometimes in logical discussions, especially when we try to convince someone about the position of God, a theistic argument, then they like to say, well, that's your faith, as if that was something lacking on our part, as if it was beneath reason. Actually, the position of faith is above reason. Ultimately, it takes us beyond the limits of reason into what Sridhar would call the planets of faith, where doubt 
is removed, and thus where one can move freely and happily. Here in this land, we live in a land of doubt. At best, movement in this world is guided by intellect, and intellect is that faculty that causes us to question, to doubt, to move cautiously, proceed with caution. So as we have faith, we can move happily and freely. So we want to go from the land of doubt to the land of faith, all doubts removed. And this is the business of the spiritual preceptor, to remove doubt. And in order to do so, he has to have knowledge of the scripture. Scripture is for removing doubt. And regularly and continually explain the Shastra to the satisfaction of all concerned, answering all questions. This is the business of the Guru. And remove the doubt so that we can proceed clearly, happily, freely with our bhajan life. So faith is an important and tangible reality and different kinds of faith. Here we're talking about three different kinds of worldly faith. When we move from worldly faith to enlightened faith in Gaudi Vaishnavism, then we have divisions of that also. The three categories of people eligible for bhakti, kanishtarikari, madhyamadikari, uttamadikari, they're all determined, those three positions, by faith. Komal Shraddha is the weak, tender faith of the neophyte, firm faith, that of the Madhyamadikari. The tender faith of the Kanishtadikari is such that he's unable to step outside of his own belief and look at it objectively and usually makes a show of being very strong when actually it's quite weak. Madhyamadikari can step outside and examine his faith and compare it with others. The Madhyamadikari's faith is, interestingly enough, we're talking about faith is full of doubts and questions and uh, introspection and thinking deeply. And that's why Shri Marsha once said, Madhyamadikari can become an atheist. And then we have Uttamadikari, who, like the Kanishtadikari, lacks discrimination. But that is a healthy lack of discrimination. And Madhyamadikari in between, full of discrimination, thinking deeply about the subject matter. So here we're talking about three types of worldly faith, and then we have enlightened faith. And in the context of enlightened faith in the school of bhakti, we have degrees of enlightened faith. Enlightened faith, of course, is that which is born of deliberating upon the import of the scripture, or it is born of association with those who have faith, who speak, of course, according to the scripture. Otherwise, faith in general in the material world is of a sattvic nature, Krishna here in verse 2 and 3, and as he begins to answer Arjuna's question, speaks about the efficient and the instrumental or material cause of faith. First is Svabhavaja, one's nature, born of his previous karma. He has a nature constituted of the modes of the three gunas, and so a faith accordingly. In the second verse, he speaks of the mind. It's the material instrument through which the faith is expressed. Mind is... According to the Bhagavad Sankhya, the Sankhya of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is, as Prabhupada would say, the analytical study of material natures, studying how the material nature is constituted, how it evolves. But this Bhagavad Sankhya accepts, of course, a supreme transcendent cause that sets the material emanation into motion. Anyway, according to the Bhagavad Sankhya, as we study from Srimad Bhagavatam, the expansion of the material world, Ahankar Ego, when mixed with sattva-guna, brings about mind. Here Krishna says that according to one's mind, we can determine his faith. Now mind gets shaded by the condition of the heart, it gets colored, and therefore that original faith that is of the nature of sattva becomes rajasic, tamasic, or it's ordinary sattva rather than one that's of an enlightened nature. There's faith in the mode of goodness, People may be, for example, unaware of the purport, the import, the conclusions of the scriptures, but worship various sattvic gods, lead a moral life. We have that kind of faith, and rajasic faith, tamasic faith. But faith itself, we have a sense that faith has virtue, and that's what Arjuna is really asking here. Isn't faith enough? What if you don't know the scripture, and the scripture is vast? There's a lot to learn there, so many things, and it takes a lot of effort. So... What if without that someone has faith and they worship? And we hear this kind of thing. Isn't there a value in faith? He really believes in it, so. Well, at least you really believe in what you're doing. That seems to have some virtue. And it does, according to the Bhagavad philosophy. Faith has virtue. It's of the nature of sattva, inherently. This is its inherent characteristic. It's sattvic. It's the conviction that sustains us. 
in our efforts. This is faith. But when this faith that is sattvic gets colored by our heart, our nature, born as a result of our previous karma, and that reflects on the mind, then it colors the faith. And so we have different types of faith and move accordingly. But this chapter stresses that faith does have virtue. Yes, there is some hope for these people who don't know the import of the scripture, but they have faith. What is the hope for them? The hope is that whatever virtuous acts they may have performed in the past, when the result comes to accrue, then they can start to lead a moral life and they will be interested in certain sections of the scripture and they can become gradually eligible and qualified for actual spiritual practices. Or, more readily, by good association. By association with a saintly person from whose lips the Shastra is always spoken and on whose tongue always is the sacred name of God. This chapter also gives some stress to the holy name. Untatsat. After describing the nature of faith, how it manifests, its inherent characteristic, how it becomes colored, then Krishna gives a description of different types of foods, different types of austerities, different types of charity, different types of sacrifices, all in the modes of nature, which we will find people engaged in, and thus we will conclude their faith is of this nature, sattvic, rajasic, or tamasic. After this description, which is the greater balance of the chapter, Krishna comes to lay stress on the holy name. Om Tat Sat. Om is, of course, a famous name of God, the sound of God. It is known throughout the scripture that Om represents God. Tat, Tatvamasi. The Tat in Tatvamasi represents God. And Sat also, Krishna will explain, means reality. So reality is that from which the illusion of the material world arises. That is God. Om, Tat, Sat, these are all names of God. Now Krishna uses them in a particular way. But the point of bringing this up in this chapter is that if people who are of faith and they don't reject the scripture, even though they don't know it, what is the hope for them? As I said, well, gradually by piety they can come to study more carefully and qualify themselves for spiritual life by good association. And Krishna says, by chanting the name, Om, Tat, Sat. Therefore, he said, all austerities, all charity, and all sacrifices should be begun with this utterance, Om Tat Sat, which will overcome any defect, which will ensure the result of a sattvic type of faith, and will overcome any defect in that ordinary sattvic faith, in the rajasic faith and tamasic faith, will qualify one from rajasic faith and tamasic faith to bring them to sattvic faith, and from sattvic faith to enlightened faith. Om Tat Sat. As we sense, the whole world sense, faith has some virtue. It does. But it needs to be combined with scripture. So sometimes we kind of criticize this kind of weak faith. Oh, just because you believe you have faith, but we have to combine it with knowledge. Knowledge means scripture. Then it will be fruitful. But although that's true and we emphasize that, that is not to say that faith doesn't have value because if one doesn't have that kind of faith, then there's no hope for him. And Krishna emphasizes that in the previous chapter and in this chapter as well. So we want to come anyway from a faith that's colored by the modes of material nature to pure and enlightened faith. And this chanting of the holy name is most fruitful. Shradhanam. Om actually covers the entire transcendent realm and the whole realm of religious activities as well. The experiential spiritual life and the religious life is covered by Om. And Tat specifically covers that experiential side of the equation, tattvamasi. This is to be uttered by renunciates, those who aren't interested in fruit of gain, but who aren't interested in transcendental life. And sat, on the other hand, according to Krishna's explanation here in this chapter, refers to that other side of the equation. Again, om is on both sides. Tat is on one towards renunciation and sat towards religious activities. It means sattvaguna. It's a very uh, nice mantric formula that Krishna has given. All activities should be preceded by this om tat sat. will ensure their success. Even if you give a business gift, business gift means charity in the rajaguna. You give the gift because you know you're going to get some some business out of that. You chant om tat sat. Then. Yes. is the idea. It purifies the defect in that, and gradually the consciousness will become purified such that we can 
give out of goodness and give out of ultimately out of enlightened life, which is a whole life of giving. One thing is to give of material objects, another thing to give of the self. The full giving of the self allows one to give in love to others. So, Shraddha, Shiddhar says, like a compass in the ocean, in the middle of the ocean, you cannot see where the shore, which way to go. The compass will guide us. So our faith that is tempered by good company, by good association, and by scripture, this alone will give us standing in the land and planets of faith. There's no other means. Enlightened faith means that we are constantly moving in such a way as to acknowledge superior authority, dependence on those above us. Faith means no faith in our own resources, but faith that there's help from above, that there's a watchful eye that pays attention to what we're doing. We haven't got to worry, as Bhaktisiddhanta and Sarsvati Thakur used to say, don't try to see God, but act in such a way that God will want to see you. So there's a conscious world. They're aware of our efforts and, in, and intentions. So we should move with confidence in this regard and depend on them. And by this culture, as Shiddha Marsh like to explain, this is the vehicle to enter the spiritual plane faith. It translates out into a most substantial reality. The whole plane of Baikuntha and Goloka is faith, absence of doubt, and therefore the free movement of the heart. As I said sometimes before, if you go to a foreign country and you don't know everything about it, so you read the labels before you eat anything that's in the jar on the store. You try to find out what's in it. But if you go home, you sit at the table, and your mother says, eat this, and you don't have any question, well, what's in it? The background behind her command is affection, knowledge, concern, love. Actually, the Vedic utterances are sometimes like that, commands, but who has shraddha, faith in Shastra, feels the affectionate background behind the Shastra. Chaitanya Charitamrita defines faith really in this way. Faith means faith in Shastra. Faith means shraddha shabde, the word faith, kohe sudhidha nishchai, kushne bhakti koile krita karma hoi. Mahaprabhu taught Sanatana like this. Would we understand in this kind of faith that simply by dedicating myself to Krishna, I have no other obligation. If we don't have this kind of faith, then we're under so much obligation, according to Shastra, to move in a particular way, according to the Dharma Shastra. We're in the realm of karma. But if we somehow get a transcendental faith in Krishna by good company, then we come under not those laws. We come under Shastra, but under those Shastra conjunctions that govern Bhakti, Bhakti Shastra. We're relieved of a great trouble, actually, great religious trouble, by developing faith in Krishna and having the adhikar for treading the path of bhakti. And coming under that, then moving accordingly, then we have scope for entering the land of faith, removal of all doubt. Like I say, when you come home, then you feel safe, at ease. You're in an affectionate land. So this development of faith is what bhakti is really all about. Rupa Goswami says what? Adho shraddha. It begins with faith. And all the successive stages that he mentions really are just developments of that faith, a thickening, a condensing of that faith. Entering the land of faith, entering the homeland of the heart, one feels free, free movement. No doubt the mind, the mental system doesn't get in the way. So this is is ultimately what Krishna is teaching in Bhagavad Gita in the 17th chapter. Let me read a little bit from these reports of these first three verses. Verse 1, Krishna concluded... In the previous chapter, by distinguishing between the godly and the ungodly in terms of their adherence to scripture. The godly adhere to scripture, whereas the ungodly do not. However, Arjun wonders at the commencement of this chapter about the status of those who out of laziness do not take the trouble to understand the import of the scripture, yet in accordance with local tradition, nonetheless worship the various gods and goddesses described in the scripture. Such people do not disregard the scripture, but they do not take time to understand it. They fall in between those who follow it properly and those who have no regard for scripture whatsoever, being both similar and dissimilar to the godly and ungodly. Arjuna asks about the quality of their faith, shraddha. Is it sattva, rajas, or tamas? Furthermore, he wants to know the relationship between faith and scriptural adherence. Is not faith alone sufficient for spiritual progress? This we've discussed. 
The Lord of Shri said, The faith of the embodied souls that is born of their materially acquired nature is of three types, sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic. Now hear about this. The color of one's faith is directly related to its cause. If the cause of one's faith is saintly association and deliberation on the import of the scripture, it is enlightened faith, pure sattva. Such enlightened faith is in turn the cause of one's spiritual progress, more the measure of one's attainment. We live in a world of doubt, yet our highest prospect lies in entering the land of faith, all doubt removed. Faith in general is of the nature of the material influence of sattva. Whatever one has faith in, that faith itself is a manifestation of sattva. Thus the sense of its being virtuous is universal. It is the conviction behind sustained effort. However, that in which one places his faith is determined by the influence of one's acquired nature. One's acquired nature at birth is a product of his past karma. This nature is constituted of a combination of the three gunas in which one of these three predominates. The predominating influence of sattva, rajas or tamas, determines the object of one's faith and thus colors that which is in and of itself sattvic with shades of rajas and tamas making it threefold. The efficient cause of one's faith is one's acquired nature. Its material or ingredient cause is the internal organ or mind to which Krishna next turns Arjuna's attention. 3. One's faith corresponds with one's mind, O descendant of Bard. A person is made of his faith. One is whatever his faith is. The internal organ or mental makeup is indicated here by the word sattva. It is of the nature of illumination. Mind is a transformation of the principle of egotism, hankar, influenced by sattva Here Krishna says that one's faith corresponds with one's mind. Because the mind is a transformation of sattva, faith is intrinsically sattvic. However, every individual's mind reflects their heart's condition under the influence of the three gunas. Thus, one's nature, reflected in the mind, produces a particular quality of faith, be it sattvic, rajasic, or tamasic. Changing one's materially acquired nature is possible through the acquisition of knowledge derived from deliberation on the import of scripture and subsequent worship. This causes pure sattva to dominate and bring about the illumination necessary for enlightened life. Otherwise, the dominant guna's influence on the mind determines one's faith. This is the position of those whose faith causes them to worship, but who do not take the time to deliberate on the import of the scripture. The quality of their particular faith is revealed through the object of their veneration, which then Krishna goes on to speak about various objects of worship by which we can determine somewhat through outward symptoms the nature of one's faith, which in and of itself is internal. Any question? Well, he might uh, tend to see more bhakti in someone than is actually there. But because he has such deep faith in the power of bhakti and such a deep understanding of the nature of bhakti, he treats it as if it's full-blown. And that can be a kind of lack of discrimination, whereas the Madhya Madhikari will discriminate more in preaching. So we find Prabhupada would say things like that, like, oh, he's got the bhav. And he would think, must be, they're chanting Krishna Nam. Krishna Nam gives bhav, and their arms up, so they must be in bhav, ecstasy. So there's a kind of a blindness that comes with their faith. Kanishtadikari has blind faith in a way that he needs to have his eyes opened by Shastra. But then the Uttamadagari again comes to the closed eyes. His eyes are closed, but he's looking inside <laughs> and seeing everything from a deeper perspective. So he's very generous and doesn't discriminate. The gopis paid obeisances to the trees and to the earth and to the creatures in the forest, thinking that they had more devotion than themselves. We can't accept that. But that was their vision. They were lacking discrimination. That kind of lack of discrimination, that's wanted. Whereas the Kanishtadikari's lack of discrimination, he has to get beyond. And he does so by study of the scripture. Then his faith becomes strong. And ultimately it becomes strong because he becomes inspired to practice more diligently, more seriously, 
And by diligent practice, he gets experience. He moves in the direction of Uttamadikari. The Kanishtadikari has little, if any, experience or scriptural knowledge. But he has faith in the conclusions of the scriptures that simply by dedicating myself to Krishna, all of my bases will be covered. But exactly how to dedicate himself and to be determined in that dedication and constant in it, that he doesn't have. So it's start and go, stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. So when he tempers his faith by Shastra, he takes that faith like it's like steel, puts it in the fire of Shastra and the discrimination and the introspection that Shastra demands, the close examination of the scripture, the full exercise of one's intellect. His intelligence is not fully involved. Mishta involves the full exercise of one's intellect, so it means the study of the Shastra requires some intelligence. What does Bhagavatam say? Nasta prayeshu abadreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya. Bhagavati Uttama Shloka Bhakti Bhavati Nashtiki Tadada Jastamo Bhava Kamalu Balayastaji Chaitai Tiranabi Dhamsti Tamsatve Prasidati This is Nishta. There may be some trace elements of Rajagun Tamaguna, like Prabhupada used to say, you plug out, the fan may still go around. Therefore, we're taught, we're cautioned by Rupa Goswami, judge a person by their faith. Try to see their faith. Try to see it somehow or other. The conviction in Krishna, that determination to serve Krishna, the desire to propagate Krishna's teachings, these things are not easy to come by. Even if we see in that person something that seems undesirable, we should not judge by that. We should judge with another eye, eye to the nature of their faith that fuels them. As Krishna says here, a man is his faith. Shradhuayam purusha, we are our faith. Somebody may have some other characteristics, attributes, but if he's an athlete, and that's what he is, he lives and eats and drinks for sports and so forth, then people will see him accordingly. And they tend to neglect the other things and make him out to be a great person in this world on account of his absorption in athletics because they're so popular. But so in devotion, and who has taken the time to study the scriptures and can explain them and so forth. This is someone who has some experience. And there's Madhi Madhikari in the least. Where Kanishtadikari has not applied is her intelligence that, well, in conjunction with the revealed scripture to analyze what it is I'm doing, what does the scripture say about it, what is really the import here of this verse and this section and these things. Now, everybody doesn't have a big capacity, perhaps, for studying the scripture. So what does Bhagavatam says? It gives us two things when it describes this nishta. What are they? Bhagavati Uttama Shloki Bhakti Bhavati Nashtiki Two kinds of Bhagavat. They are implied in this verse of Bhagavatam. They brought out in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Bande Sri Krishna Chaitanya Nityananda Sohodito Goradai Pushpavanto Chitro Sandotumonado. In explaining this verse, Pranam to Gaur Nityananda, who have risen like the sun and the moon on the western horizon of Goda to dissipate the darkness and bestow benediction upon all the conditioned souls. Explaining this verse, Krishna Kaviraj Goswami says, by the mercy of these two, we get the association of two Bhagavatas, Book Bhagavata and the Person Bhagavata. By studying carefully the Book Bhagavata and serving the Person Bhagavata, you get love of God. So, even if we can't study the scripture, we say, oh, the Maharaj always talking about studying the scriptures, and that's just too difficult for me, then what shall we do? Serve that person, that Maharaj, who knows the scripture. <laughs> He's the person Bhagavata. Then you stay under his care. Then you can become Nishta. So there's no getting around it. You study it carefully and understand it, and or you serve the person, or really both. So we have to move from this Karnishta Adhikari position to that Madhya Madhikari position, and this is the way. And this has to become then our primary characteristic. We may have some other marginal characteristic that lingers, or just the Prabhda Karma is there. Again, you pull the plug out, the fan is going around the Prabhda Karma, but he's not affected by it. It doesn't change or alter their conviction, what they are, living, breathing, for serving Krishna. So Komal Shraddha, that we don't want. We want it as a good start. We want to strengthen it, put it in the fire of service to the Bhagavata person and to the book, Bhagavata, and related type of scriptures. Make it strong. Like I said, you take steel, you put it in the fire as long as it can last, then pull it out and then cool, it becomes stronger each time. 
So we have to make an effort, dive in. What is the meaning of this? Then we become Madhi Madhikari, and you can help the real service for others. Nishta, Ruchi, is all Madhi moving in the direction of Ruchi, Uta Madhikari, Asakti, Bhav, and this Jatarati is unautomatic and to Uttamadikari. And Uttamadikari, people talk all the time and these days, oh, Guru must be Uttamadikari. Actually, Guru is Madhimadikari. As we know, either comes down from Uttamadikari or comes up from Kanishtadikari. Guru, <laughs> if one is serving in the capacity of Guru and preaching, then you will see the characteristics of Madhimadikari. That's what you will see. And Uttamadikari characteristics, they'll be covered. I mean, they'll show up sometimes, like I say, Prabhupada would show that kind of generosity and lack of discrimination. And you might think, well, we know more than him. <laughs> he said this about that guy, and I know <laughs> such and such and such and such. What we don't know is what bhakti really is and how little touch with that is so valuable. Sri Dharmarsh once called me close and said, you should understand, bhakti, actually he said association of devotees, is a little bit small thing, like in the atom. The atom is very tiny, but has great power. So association with sadhu, even a little bit, has great power to transform our life. And he knows that. The transformation is that we get bhakti, we get shraddha for bhakti. We become eligible, even in a crude way, for engaging in bhakti, chanting the holy name. And he knows, oh, he has confidence. What will be the result in due course? And he tends to read in terms of the future, the potential of that soul, rather than in terms of his present. So we want that kind of company, we want to become that kind of devotee, so we should understand all these things. Keep good company, get good faith. And faith is very hard to build and very easy to take down. But if it's strong, I mean, that's relation to Komal Shraddha, tender faith, easy to take down. We should understand the import of this. Sometimes I hear about faith in Prabhupada, and it's very loud. Only Prabhupada. At the same time, if we study that faith closely, what will be our conclusion from Bhagavad Gita, from what we've heard tonight? When that faith in Prabhupada, for example, or whomever, but let's say Prabhupada, is so strong and so fanatical that it translates out, if you look carefully at it, in one direction or another, into no faith in, for example, Prabhupada's Guru Varga, or that person who Prabhupada said is, I consider him my own Sikshu Guru, Sridhar Maharaj. Now, granted, some of Prabhupada's Godbrothers, which is the Guru Varga, may not have been as worthy of service in our faith as Sridhar Maharaj, but you know, to discriminate, some of them are <laughs> Sridhar Maharaj, the foremost of them, without a doubt. And if our faith in Prabhupada translates out such that we have no faith in Sridhar Maharaj, what to speak of criticism of him? This is just one example. Then what kind of faith is that? That faith is obviously tempered by Rajaguna. And when they find imaginary faults in Sridhar Maharaj or another such person, it's colored by Tamaguna. Because it's not based on Shastra. It's not coming down. We want that kind of faith. This is what Krishna is talking about here in Bhagavad Gita. They have faith and they worship, but they don't really know the import of the scripture. I'm taking it to a higher level. They have faith in Krishna, in Bhakti, in Prabhupada, or whomever it may be, but it's at the cost of faith in maybe even previous Acharyas. We hear, we're not Rupanugas, we're Prabhupada Nugas. What is that? What kind of statements are these? We hold our ears. And it is symptomatic of Rajaguna. What is that? We criticize others and we think our position is better thereby. Because we're good at criticizing so many other people and the shortcomings we see in them, we think we're in a better position. We haven't gone anywhere. They may be faults that may be there or defects from one perspective. And then the other one is you, you imagine faults in that person. This faith is not fully enlightened faith. It's tempered by the modes of nature. Krishna gives us a great science for understanding all of these things. The value of knowledge. Rupa Goswami says, as I've said many times, quoting him, in the beginning, a little knowledge and a little detachment is useful. A little. And we looked at the example of Raghunathas Goswami, how much renunciation he had. <laughs> he had a little. Mahaprabhu told him, renunciation is my life. Because he's speaking as a sannyasi. But 
from renouncing really worldly concerns, you can have life of bhakti. And renunciation means discrimination, because when you step back from a thing and look at it objectively without any vested interest or attachment, you can see it for what it is. So we have to step back from the material world. That's bhairagya. See it for what it is. Then it's the modes of nature (laughs) moving. That's not what you thought it was. Then with proper discrimination, and more importantly, of course, engagement in bhakti, with proper discrimination we can analyze the scripture properly, and and it will help us. It will help to fuel our bhajan life. So anyway, we want enlightened faith. We want madhyamadikari, uttamadikari faith. Not kanishtadikari faith, not to speak of anything less than that. So the role of shastra and the role of faith are dealt with in this chapter, both. Another question? Yes. This um, Kanishta Adhikar, I think you're talking about the kind of fanatical reason you can of, you know, Prabhupada, that's tempered by the modes of nature, passion, and ignorance. Does it have any spiritual value in terms of attaining bhakti? I mean, it seems like it could almost work against you. <laughs> well, if people make offenses, that certainly doesn't help them. And if they offend great devotees, it, it, their shraddha can be uprooted. It's possible. So we caution against that. It has value, but if you abuse it, then it becomes detrimental. Initially it has value, but this is a problem. See, you have faith, it has great value, you get in the circle of devotees. I remember uh, Govinda Maharaj once said many years ago that, I see that only the disciples of Prabhupada came, they had no background of Vaishnava Aparad. And faithfully they embraced the teachings of Swami Maharaj of Prabhupada, and they were making progress. When they come into the circle of so many Vaishnavas, although Prabhupada cautioned us and taught us and so forth, still the potential for Aparad comes. All kinds of Aparad, save Aparad. I mean, you have to start somewhere with Nam Aparad, but, but it's particularly Vaishnava Aparad that we want to avoid. And he said, and I see they come in the circle and then they make Vaishnava Aparad, and now the whole thing has become problematic. They're not making advancement. So, with the faith, you get entrance in there, but if you do the wrong thing, yeah, it becomes counterproductive in a way. So, therefore, Krishna stresses both things. Yes, faith is virtuous. Yes. But it has to be combined with proper understanding of Shastra. If it's to change us. Otherwise, this faith that's born of the modes of nature, it's not based on proper understanding of Shastra. It won't change your life. But when it, that faith is elevated to sattva and pure sattva, enlightened faith based on scriptural deliberation and so forth, and sadhusanga. That's the only kind of faith that can change your life, transform you. That we want. So both things, they come, they don't read, they don't know what is Vaishnava. How can you not, you wonder, how can you not know what is Vaishnava Parad? That what goes on out there today sometimes in the name of really Vaishnavism is mind-boggling. Their food and drink is Vaishnava Parad, some of these people. And so rampant, the fanaticism. So few devotees know the Shastra. So few. So much fanaticism. So much sentiment. And what did Rupa Goswami say? Shruti smriti paranadi pantaratik vidimini kantiki hare bhakti rupatyai vakalupate. becomes a disturbance to the society. If the bhakti is not based on Shastra, then it just becomes a disturbance, a botheration to those who really practice. So we want good company, good faith. And Bhakti Vinotakwa says that the seed of Bhakti, Bhakti Latavij is faith. It means that Vaishnav who gives us a diksha shares his faith. Krishna says a man is his faith, a person is his faith. What is his faith? He shares that with us. This is the seed. And then we are obliged to cultivate that seed. That's our business. <laughs> Hear, chant, water the seed, serve Vaishnavs. All right, we stop there. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai, Guru Vishnu Guru Parampara ki jai, Guru Bhaktivinoda ki jai, Guru Premanandi.